Hey folks, it is 5.14 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, January the 26th, 2022 years from something. Today I'm going to just speak, this is probably going to be a short video, certainly short in comparison to many of my videos, but probably pretty brief. My brother sent me an, uh, an article, uh, it had to do with a story that was related in, in, in one of the books that was published by the uh, Hakloit Society. Um, and this is important, they're important, they're going to, they're going to play a, a very key role in this. And uh, let's just say for anyone who's been studying um, or watching those people who purport to study alternative history and of course have been inundated with this Tartaria narrative. Know this, that all the information essentially that we have on geography and on travels of, of all kinds there, it's all either controlled by or utterly overshadowed by this uh, Hakloit society, and you know you can get the um, you can get the basic um, ins and outs of who the um, Hakloit society is today. Um, they certainly do function in a a very different way today. A ve kind of a public friendly way today and maybe they functioned in the same way um, back in the 1800s when they were said to have started publishing like most other publishers if you start looking at books looking at old books most of what you're going to find is that they are published even people they claim are ancient authors are either going to be published in the 1800s or sometimes you'll find publications claiming to be 1600s. It's super rare when I find 15 or 17. Uh, most of them, just saying the, the vast majority, um, claim to be published in the 1600s or 1800s. The oddity about the a lot of the... Um, authors uh, claim to be published in the 1600s is you don't see a lot of other works in which commentary is given on those works until the 1800s. Everything kind of snaps back to the 1800s a lot. And of course, it, th that sort of thing is, is one of the um, factors that has allowed uh, for a lot of shills not everybody who speculates on this is a shill, but a lot of them, they really are. They have all the signs of being a shill because they are specifically um, going out of their way to craft a specific narrative, not based on, let's just say, the, um, the whole body of facts as, as it could be observed and related, but on just picking and choosing certain factors and then shaping a narrative from that. And many of them, uh, they're right on the same page with those um, cherry-picked factors. Um, I mean, there are some people in alternative uh, research that I don't really agree with on their conclusions, but at least these people aren't going along with the um, what's become the mainstream of alternative history, geography, so on and so forth, research. So this Hakloit, the official story goes that they were um, they were simply a society that was um, founded by a, a Richard Hakloit, um, his cousin being a, a lawyer, um, so he wasn't nobody and they they claim that he was welsh but you have to remember something when you see things like this man was welsh this 
So one was English, this one was German, this one was French. All they're saying is that they were um, typically born in that place. It doesn't mean that they are ethnically the same as everyone else who lived there at the time or since. Um, this sort of language, which is why I spend so much time on language and it is so complicated, is because they have used it in very subtle ways. The people who are running the world, they're quite intelligent, they're quite subtle, and they have woven a, a great uh, tapestry of lies. So you always have to point out what's wrong with certain terminology and why we cannot continue to use certain types of terminology or, or mentalities when we try to understand things. So you'll get the official narrative maybe if you just go to the Wikipedia on Hochleut. But know this, essentially Hochleut's um, books and, and, and the, the great volume of books is um, mostly what you'll find in like a, a history of, uh, I want to remember what it's particularly called, maybe Principal Navigations, Voyages, and Discoveries of the English Nation Made by Sea or Overland to the Most Remote or Farthest Distant Quarters of the Earth at Any Time. This is seriously one title, uh, The Compass of These. 1500 years divided into three several parts. This is still all the title, you see. If you see what my mouse is up there, it's pretty much... Yeah, they, they, they did not... There was no short titles back then. I'm, I'm, and if anybody has read these old books, they know that. I, they'll, they'll literally be, sometimes in these old books, there will be a dozen pages at the beginning of the book that actually is, they're just chapter titles. But a chapter title will encompass so much, basically in parentheses. Um, this is what this chapter contains, and it has it all in parentheses, which actually I think makes it a bit easier if, if, if you're simply navigating a book and you, you want to find a subject reference. I guess before we had um, Acrobat and could do uh, just word searches. So the reason that um, Hakloit matters, because Hakloit has had a, a great deal of hegemony over what we understand about uh, voyages, travels, um, different people, geography, and history. They've had a huge amount of influence. And the funny thing is, books from the Hakloit Society have not, they haven't seemed to have ever um, been in danger of going extinct like so many other books that uh, may have had alternative narratives to the, the books produced by the Hakloit Society. Um, the other reason that uh, I would look at Hochloit suspiciously, they, if you look at uh, some of their books actually print uh, significant members of uh, Hochloit, and if you start looking into the names of those members printed in there, you'll start seeing these connections, establishment connections, um, royal society connections. The other thing is, if there is something in a name, and I believe there is. We can just look at the name Hochloit. Um And now Hochloit would actually be the um, uh, the Masoretic way of pronouncing a, a certain word, which would actually be Kali, or sometimes it's um, it's used in variations like Kalit or Kalut. Um, oftentimes translated as imprisonment. Um, but I would say is probably far more appropriate if we look at Kali and Kalit, uh, Kalut as um, controlling, okay? More, to, to have um, sort of full hegemony over a thing. And anybody who knows just a little teeny bit about Masoretic Hebrew knows that uh, the Ha is... Um, it's really how they pronounce. They aspirate the e at the front of Obri words. The e is just um, it's just signaling 
a um, proper noun. Essentially, the something. The, you know. So, I, you know, I, I don't pass those things up like, well, it just looks like coincidence. It also doesn't seem like a coincidence to me that um, one, a huge uh, financial advisory firm also in London, like Hockloyd, it goes by the same name. They actually adopted that name. It's not named after a guy like they claim the Hock, Richard Hockloyd. No, its founders weren't named Hockloyd. Its founders' names were Reynolds and James. And the the majority of the men who founded it, so if the majority, then probably most, were ex-British MI6 agents. They appear to have a, a lot of influence on financial markets. Uh, maybe one could say uh, they teach uh, others uh, how to have a hegemony over a market. Hockloyd. Okay. So just giving you that bit of background on Hockloyd. Now, here's where Hockloyd's pretty interesting regarding this article. Okay. This article is from AmericanHeritage.com. I'll post it. It's a long article. I'm not even going to go through much of any of it. I'll give you a, just a little background. It is, it's mostly revolving around a guy by the name of um, David Ingram. Okay. David Ingram was said to have been a common sailor in about the 1500s. And he was said to uh, have been on a, uh, a, a British naval ship uh, as part of a small fleet going back and forth to what would have been, right, the West Indies at the time. And the story goes like this. So he's part of a small fleet, and this small fleet uh, apparently got into a, a little bit of a tussle with some Spanish ships. And um, though they were sailing uh, towards Veracruz, so it's about the middle, uh, the middle of the uh, the Mexican um, isthmus. <laughs> um, so between Yucatan and I guess you would say, let's say like the southern coast of um, Louisiana, Mississippi. So figure between those two points, you know, it would be right uh, about the middle. And what they say is um, they had ships damaged. They loaded everyone onto one particular ship. And um, they, they got all turned around or something. And ended up in a different place than they, they had thought. A number of the men volunteered to go ashore and try to, to walk somewhere. A lot of it sounds really dicey. Just that part of the narrative just sounds very weird. And then when you consider where they said to have put down, now a lot of reports say that they actually um, docked and let those men out at a point that was far to the south of uh, Veracruz. And which would have made, because what happened was this, um, this David Ingram was said to have walked um, really the breadth of America sort of uh, south to north pretty far north, like New England north, um, over the course of uh, a, a very short time. Now, they were missing for, let's see. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I had it highlighted, but this highlighting program that I'm trying out, Snippet, just erases my highlights. They keep what I highlighted in like a little snippet um, cloud, but it, it doesn't really help me because it's all disjointed. I like the highlights within the context. Anyways, um, so he disappears for a certain length of time and then all of a sudden they find out that he traveled from what they first thought was a point south of, not Veracruz, I'm sorry, Tampico. South of Tampico to up almost near um, Nova Scotia. And he was supposed to have done it in this very, very brief time. And that was one of the highlights I had that I can't find just off the top of my head. I'll post the article. Here's the interesting part, right? So, um, 
after he does this, he he says he came across essentially civilization is what he's saying. He's saying that uh, no, it wasn't just a a, a great wild uh, place. He was saying that I they entered various kingdoms. Uh, there were various kings in, in these places and subjects and peoples and things like that. He, he didn't have a story to tell that, you know, they were going through the wilds of, you know, but that they were traveling through, not the whole time, but they were certainly entering one kingdom after the other, and there were um, certain different peoples that they met with varying cultures. But when he described them, they all sounded like civilized cultures and people based on the, the things that he said. Now, here's where it gets weird, and, and this is the, I think, sort of the creepy convoluted part, and we have to be really skeptical skeptical concerning the, the Hakloit Society's role in all of this. This was published <laughs> by Hakloit. Um, I don't think it was originally published by Hakloit. They picked it up and published it, because you got to figure if Hakloit was started a couple hundred years later and it's it's in this series that has become like the uh, the gold standard of um geographical historical um bullshit you have to be concerned because here's why when i was looking into prester john one of the things that just damaged uh, every good little bit and piece I would find about Prester John, the kingdoms in the East, they would all be tainted with just ridiculous crap. And you have to wonder how much this David Ingram actually said. Like they, they talked about, he said that there were creatures with eyes and mouth in their, in their chest. And well, is, is that nonsense that they put in there to, to throw us off a bit? Or was he describing there are creatures that, that would appear to have their, their organs like a mouth or eyes, things like that, which would appear not in their head, but more in their abdomen. There are animals like that. Stingray off top of my head. So how much was nonsense? How much wasn't? It's hard to say. Here's the interesting part, though. I, I always want to go to the money and power trail if it's apparent. And it's always there. It's just how well have they hidden it. Something that's interesting about this David Ingram account, and, and maybe why it's been so messed up and, and distorted, has to do with uh, a little paragraph right in here. Um, it says, Finally, we must take account of the object of his interrogation, which was to help determine, or more likely demonstrate, the suitability of North America for English settlement. Sir Humphrey Gilbert had been a leading proponent of a Northwest Passage to the Orient. In 1578, he had obtained a charter to discover and occupy, quote, heathen lands, close quote, in that direction, quote, not actually possessed of any Christian prince or people, close quote. Later, well, I don't think I need to go on. You know what that's saying, right? This guy, and you find out that these these guys we're talking about, they they had really invested everything into this. And now the charter had caveats that they got. And we are we're we're going off the assumption that even these records are somewhat sound. And anyone could even take a look at all of this and maybe say, well, that doesn't. I don't think that those are sound records that is possible i'm i'm just going based on this information but consider it these guys who were not nobodies they had obtained a charter to try to establish this northwest passage to the orient in the west indies 
in 1578 with the caveats. What were the caveats? That they were going to be operating in heathen lands, not actually possessed of any Christian prince or people. When you see that word Christian, especially if we're talking a hundred or more years ago, that specifically means a white man. It is absolutely synonymous with white man. It doesn't have to do with anyone's profession. It has to do with a kind or a race. That is how they used it. No matter how you feel about it today, that's how they used it then. And what's remarkable is if enough influential and powerful men wanted to make sure that the knowledge of white kingdoms existing here at the time that, say, David Ingram made his travel, I'm sure they would go to great lengths to silence uh, those reports. I mean, it certainly seems that... Um, Meriwether Lewis was silenced, and he reported staying with a white and a mixed, some of them were white, some were mixed, some were quote-unquote Indian. They wintered with them on the Missouri, right near a, a place where, of course, now there is a huge impound dam covering a lot of land up there. So that's interesting. Because besides for obvious implications, we have the implication of somebody investing a whole lot of money and time into something. And if you had sailors bringing back reports that they had literally walked through civilized kingdom with white... Now, if these were kingdoms of people who were not white, if they were various aboriginals, you can call them whatever you want, brown people, black people, I don't care, but non-white peoples... This wouldn't have been a problem for those who were investing in this charter. It would be a, a much bigger problem. And one of the things we don't spend a lot of time doing is um, examining all of the politics back at the time when these things are reported to have happened. That's really important. The people at the top are few in number. And the people at the bottom are very large in number. And the people at the top always have to figure out a way to manage the people at the bottom so that the people at the bottom won't um, start looking around at one another and saying, you know, they're really, really, really screwing us. We need to go take care of this. They're always working to make sure that doesn't happen and nothing new under the sun. It's not just that they're doing that today, which they are. They were doing that then. So, with that, uh, just interesting, again, one more time, I'll post the link to this very interesting article, information, and the, uh, the Hockloit book that the, that this account can be found in, depending on the, um, I'm sorry, depending on the edition that you get, because there is information in here that they did cut it after the first edition. A lot of the, um, the narrative of this David Ingram, they cut, um, in the second edition, I don't know if they picked it up in later editions. Um, most of the Hockloit books can actually be found at archive.org. At least specifically the principal navigations at Sea of England and all that, okay? So, all right, with that, I'm going to wrap it up and um, take care, everyone.